Good evening, friends. Uh, my name is Dr. Rajadhar. Uh, I am a pulmonologist working in Kolkata. Um, gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the Thursday CCR webinar. And our topic today is on non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Before we embark on this meeting, let me have the privilege, the pleasure of wishing Dr. Narayana Pradeep a very, very happy birthday on behalf of everyone on this platform. Dr. Narayan Pradeep has been the silent worker. He's been the backbone of the Chest Council of India and he's worked behind the curtains. We wouldn't have these meetings without Dr. Narayan Pradeep and uh, Dr. Krishna. So a very, very big round of happy birthday to Dr. Narayan Pradeep and a quick video before we start our meeting. Okay, Thank you. Okay. So yeah. uh, this, was, this was the happy birthday and uh, you see on a, on a little different note, I'll wish him in Sanskrit. You see, most of us, we wish in English language, the happy birthday or the, in other, uh, you see, uh, the, the uh, so many terminology are given for the many happy returns of the day like this. But today I'm introducing the Chess Council of India, how to wish birthday in Sanskrit language. It's very simple. Shubham, Janam, Devam, Tobhyam. It is Shubham, Janam, Devas, Tobhyam. So simple. So I would so, request Chess Council members that please you can also wish to your colleagues, to your friends, to your family members, children in the oldest language of the world that is Sanskrit. You can wish in Sanskrit also. Okay, go Raja, ahead. So Dr. Suryakant, what was the last one? Abhyam, is it? Tobhyam, Tobhyam. Tabhyam, Tabhyam. Tabhyam. Shubham, Janam, Dinam, Tabhyam. Right. Yeah, Shubham, Janam, Devam, Tabhyam. Great. So thanks to Dr. Suryakant. I've learned something if, even before I'm starting the meeting today. Ah, ah. Tabhyam means you, Tumko. Okay. okay. All right. Grand. So <laughs> we'll start off. Uh, we have on the panel today. Um, let me, can we have uh, uh, Dr. Dev Kishore and Dr. Uh, Radha Munje's videos on, please? So quick round of introduction. We'll do it slightly differently today. We'll introduce everyone before we start. Um, so great pleasure to introduce Dr. Suryakant from Lucknow. I don't think we need to say anything other than the city here. So Dr. Radha Munje from Nagpur, Dr. Tarang Kulkarni from Mumbai, and Dr. Sudarshan Pothal from Katak. I've got that right. Head up, uh, Dr. Yeah, Pothal. Puri. Right. Puri. Yeah. Puri. yeah. So... Let me... Are you from Katak or Puri? You yeah, have Puri, sir. Puri. Puri. Okay. Puri. Okay. Okay. Presently at Puri, right. Okay. So, sorry, so that's okay. Puri. Okay. So, no problem. my love, love Puri, actually. I'm, um, you know, all Bengalis love Puri. So, um, exactly. warm welcome. <laughs> exactly. So, le let's start off. I'll share a presentation which I'll do over the next 15 minutes. And then we will go to the main meeting. Is it... Uh, visible to everyone uh, is the uh, ppt visible yes. to everyone yeah okay. yeah yes, visible. all right thank you so this is what i'm going to do over the next 15 minutes i'll talk a little bit about epidemiology i'll talk about who to treat i think that's one crucial question that needs to be addressed in case of non tuberculous mycobacteria i will talk a little bit about what to treat with and I'll spend a minute at the end about new development. So that's what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes are uh, odd. So all of you know that when we talk about non-tuberculous mycobacteria or mycobacterium other than tuberculosis, we are not just talking about other than tuberculosis. We are also talking about other than mycobacterium leprae. So it's other than tuberculosis and other than mycobacterium leprae. The first documented cases of NTM were in the 1950s and time moves rapidly and there's about more than 170 species as we speak today, out of which only 15 are pathogenic. So 15 pathogenic 170 species or more than 170 species means that this is a ubiquitous organism which is there in soil and water and normally it's environmental spread. Of late, there have been some reported cases of human to human spread, but that is also involving the environment. The root 
normally is inhalation, which is why we have got mainly microbiologists on the panel today, um, uh, mainly pul pulmonologists on the panel today, and Dr. Dev Kishore being the microbiologist from Kolkata on the panel today. Um, there are the pulmonary symptoms are the most common by far, and normally the infection with NTM depends on the susceptibility of the host, exposure to the organism and the interplay between the host and the environment. The incidence is reported differently from different parts of the world. And you can see the reported literature showing 1.4 to 40 per 100,000 according to the Blue Journal from 2008. That's more than 15 years ago. What, what is important is that the geographical location seems to make a difference to the incidence and prevalence of NTM throughout the world. It's also higher in certain races, certain groups in the world. For instance, North America seems to have the highest incidence of NTM throughout the world. The previous period prevalence is 11, yeah, uh, more than 100, 11, yeah, over 11 years is more than 100 per 100,000 among patients above the age of 70. So above the age of 70, you see a sharp spike in the number of cases. However, what is true is that across the world, irrespective of which geographical location you look at, the numbers are rising. So I've put six different countries in front of you. I could have easily trebled the number to 24, but be it the UK, be it Germany, be it Canada, Australia, uh, or the US, the numbers have kept increasing over the years. The graph that you see at the right bottom corner, Japan, shows you two different graphs which are coming downwards. These are patients who've got microbiologically proven or clinically suspected TB. And you can see both those graphs going down, whereas the number of patients with non-tuberculous mycobacteria is going up. So the next question we need to answer, who do we treat? And in this category, there are four different conditions that I want to talk about. One is a contaminant. You understand that this is ubiquitous in soil and in water. So as a contaminant being present does not mandate that the patient or the individual gets treated. Sometimes it could just be a casual isolate. So the patient is asymptomatic. You are investigating the patient for some other condition. You might find a casual isolate of the organism. The other is infection. So when we talk about infection, we mean more than one isolation in an individual who seems to be where the organism seems ubiquitous without causing symptoms of the disease. So that's infection where you're repeatedly isolating the organism, but the disease does not manifest in the way of symptoms. The last condition is disease where the patient is symptomatic and along with it, you isolate the organism more than twice or more in the sputum or once in a bowel sample. So that's disease. However, you understand that non-tuberculous mycobacteria is mainly present in people with chronic lung disease. And in patients with bronchiectasis, in patients with COPD, the symptoms of NTM and the symptoms of a COPD or a bronchiectasis worsening would actually overlap to an extent. So even in the disease process, you need to think twice before you decide when to treat and when not to treat. So if you look at the ATS guidelines, which have been revamped and published recently, contamination and causal casual isolate are two different techniques, two different ways of isolation, which have been taken out of the equation anyway. So you wouldn't treat something which is a contaminant. You wouldn't treat a ca casual isolate. You're left with infection and you're lef left with disease. So the guidelines of the ATS say that positive culture from two separate expectorated sputum. And if the results are non-diagnostic, you consider a repeating sphere and culture or a bronchial lavage shows positivity or a tissue biopsy a bronchial biopsy shows positivity. Here, even one sample would mandate that you treat in a symptomatic individual. So infection, repeated infection, you wouldn't treat unless you anticipate that the patient is going to get immunosuppressed in the uh, future. Disease, you would treat 
in most cases, but you need to make the distinction between worsening of chronic respiratory disease versus the isolation of the NTM. So what are the symptoms that we talk about in patients with non-tuberculous mycobacteria? You've got a list on there and you would appreciate that differentiating these symptoms from a worsening of bronchiectasis or COPD might be difficult in cases. I want you to look at the bottom bit where we talk about systemic symptoms. So the fever, the weight loss, the malaise, the fatigue, all of these factors can translate into an NTM infection rather than a worsening of bronchiectasis or COPD. So the systemic manifestations of NTM, the lack of nutrition are things that need to be taken into consideration. What are the radiological features? So we said that the radiological features would start off by saying that you've got someone who's got chronically damaged lung, background chronic lung disease. But these are the various manifestations that you see. So you see on my pointer there, hopefully you see the tree and bud pattern and the nodules. You can see cavities like in the left bottom corner where my cursor is. And you can even see areas of consolidation um, and nodules. So tree and bud, bronchiectasis, cavities, nodules and consolidation, as you see in the CT scan pictures um, in the bottom, are the various patterns that you would see on HRCT in patients with NTM. Now, this looks at infection versus disease. And I want you to see the top two graphs. So the top two graphs are patients who have one transient isolate of non-tuberculous mycobacteria and the other is two or more isolations of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So two or more isolates we have called persistent. Transient is one isolate. An active disease where there are symptoms is in the red line at the bottom. And you can see that patients who have active disease do far worse in the way of loss of lung function, whereas the transient and the persistent lines overlap with each other and the disease does not really translate into a lot of lung function, which justifies the point that most patients who just have infection normally do not need treatment in the long term. So let's take one example. So this is one of our recent cases. This is a homemaker who is a 45 year old lady diagnosed of idiopathic bronchiectasis, increased sputum volumes, multiple infections in the past and antibiotic responsiveness has decreased gradually over a period of time. And you can see on the CT again, not very different to the CT I showed you a little while ago, you can see the tree and bud pattern more in the left lung than on the right, along with multiple nodules there. So this patient has a bronchial lavage and the lavage grows pseudomonas and MAC. So it grows mycobacterium avium intracellulare and it grows pseudomonas. So now comes the question, this is the patient who's got a disease, but the disease might have worsened due to two different factors, A, the pseudomonas and B, the MAC. What would you do? Would you start treating both bugs together? Would you treat one or would you treat uh, the other? So what we did here was to give IV antibiotics directed to the pseudomonas. We eradicated the pseudomonas. We sent the patient home on tobramycin nebulization. And over a 10 day period, the patient improved back to their baseline. The CT pictures, the one you see on the right on there, improved and the lung function stabilized. So, this patient is one patient who is diseased but does not require treatment for NTM because treatment of the pseudomonas has caused reversal of the worsening of symptoms and hence some amount of individualization for treatment should be done even when you're isolating the bug in chronically diseased lung. So the factors which you need to consider in the disease context is extent of disease, the rate of progression of disease, the significance of progression, and the patient. So let's start off with extent. So when we talk about extent, we talk about the number of lobes that are affected, whether the disease is bilateral or not. You also talk about the clinical state of the patient which determines the extent and progression. So patients who are undernourished, like we said, with a low BMI, patients who have a cavity, patients who have a large burden of symptoms, and patients who have isolation of a fungus, along with the NTM sometime in the past, 
normally behave poorly and has rap have rapid disease progression. So those are clinical things that need to be taken into account. What about the patient themselves? So if you have someone with bronchiectasis who is waiting to undergo an organ transplant of any description and you isolate NTM, even if the NTM is not symptomatic, you would treat that patient because you envisage that this patient is undergoing to undergo immunosuppression post-transplant. So if your patient is undergoing immunosuppression for any reason, in that scenario, you might treat isolation of the bug without causing clinical symptoms. And that's where consideration of the nature of the patient needs to be taken into account. I'll skip this and we'll come to this patient. So this is someone who is a chef of Italian origin, working in a hotel, no past medical history, no drug history, two month history of cough, weight loss and sweat. And you can see this particular patient has all the features, the risk factors of getting treated. You can see the cavity there. You can see areas of nodules, stream mud, etc. And the patient had systemic features in the form of weight loss and sweats. So that's a patient with disease, symptomatic, whom you would definitely treat in the long term. So this patient had sputum AFP, which was positive. The gene expert was negative. Initially, the patient was started on anti-tubercular treatment. However, when the cultures came back, mycobacterium xenopy was isolated and the four drug category one anti-tubercular treatment was changed to a combination of rifampicin, ethambutol and clarithromycin. And the CT on the right shows you after one year of treatment that there's been significant improvement and reversal of the cavity on the right lung. And you can see that on the bottom cuts also. What about disease progression? So disease progression is defined by the microbiology, the number of bugs that you isolate, the burden of uh, the NTM, the radiological features, whether they are changing, increasing or not. And of course, the clinical features need to be considered. This is a lovely study from 2016, which looks at bugs which need treatment versus bugs which don't. So on the right side, you see bugs like avium intracellulare, cansasi, and abscesses, and even to an extent, xenopy. On the left, you have mainly the saprophytic organisms, the chelonie, the fortuitum, the gordonie, etc., which are basically saprophytes, and the isolation would not mandate treatment. So the significance of the organism that you isolate, especially in the case of avium intracellulare, Kansasi and abscesses, and in some cases, xenopy mandate treatment. For the others in the basket, you normally would not treat these patients. And then this is a heat map, which tells you that it's not just one NTM that you isolate. There are actually multiple uh, non-tuberculous my mycobacteria that you isolate. One of the fallacies in clinical practice, and I want all of you to remember this, is that the rapid growers get isolated more as compared to the slow growers. And you need to keep culturing the organisms for longer because you can actually get more number of NTM on longer growth. But we'll ask Dr. Dev Kishore about this later on when we discuss microbiology in the discussion. And the patient factors, the comorbidities, intolerance to drugs that need to be given to these patients, how long you treat the patient for and patient preference need to be considered in these individuals. This is a chart which shows you the various treatment regimes that are available. However, it's important to remember that if you've not managed to identify the bug, your treatment of choice would be rifampicin, ethambutol, and a macrolide, mainly clarithromycin. So that's your broad umbrella management treatment that I want you to remember, the rifampicin, the ethambutol, and the macrolide in the way of clarithromycin. You can see some changes there. So in Kansasi, there's a suggestion of iron age, However, there are good trials in Kansasi which also talk about use of clarithromycin. The one exception, the most difficult bug to treat is mycobacterium abscesses. And you can see it on the bottom there where the regime is different. You've got amikacin, you've got injectable drugs in the way of imipenoxifoxacin, the macrolides. Remains. However, treatment of abscesses is difficult, eradication and recurrence numbers are much greater with abscesses as compared to other bugs. So abscesses is the challenge. Otherwise, it's mainly rifampicin, ethambutol, and clarithromycin. 
the mortality from this disease seems to be high. And that's the concern. You saw the increasing numbers throughout the globe. The mortality is the concern. The five-year mortality from a Danish study comes to at about 40%. And then you see various studies which quote mortality at five years between 40 to 60%. So significant mortality. The disease is often refractory. Drugs need to be considered continued beyond 18 months in a lot of cases. Mycobacterium avium intracellularis seems to be the most refractory to culture conversion. And you can see the large range there between 13 to 86 percent. If the patient does not culture convert, then adding in second line drugs are something that we need to do. However, the outcome with these second line drugs are poor. I won't waste for the time. This is the last bit where we talk about newer drugs. The newer drugs are not actually newer drugs. They are drugs used for other indications which are now being used in patients with NTM. This is a study which was carried out with clofazimin. There's bedaquiline, which is now being having large number of trials in patients with non-tuberculous non mycobacteria with variable results. And this linezolate where trials are ongoing and these are all data which is extrapolated from data from TB. So clofazimin, bedaquiline, denazolide are probably drugs which are going to come into the diagnosed in the treatment armamentarium in the not so distant future. The one drug which is promising, which, I've, uh, which is why I've kept it till the last, is nebulized or liposomal amikacin. So liposomal amikacin is a drug that's now entered into the treatment guidelines in a lot of countries in Europe and is a drug which is probably going to be licensed sometime this year in India and would be used for a variety of indications, including non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So I'll stop there and we'll come to the discussion. Um, if I can request all of my friends to switch on their videos. Grand. Um, so Dev Kishan, uh, I'm sorry, I think. Yeah, thank you. So Dev Kishan, I'm sorry, I probably did not start off by introducing you. I'm very sorry. So Dr. Dev no Kishan problem. Gupta, close colleague of mine in Kolkata, microbiologist by trade, one of the finest around, and he is also going to be a part of the panel today. Um, Dr. Radha Munje, if we could start off with your video on and then maybe we could have it off again for little bits when you're uh, busy. I'll start off with uh, Dr. Surya Khan. Dr. Surya Khan, um, yeah. let's talk a little bit about India. I haven't really spoken a lot about India. Um, and part of the reason is I couldn't find very much data about NTM in India. However, we do know that the numbers are increasing even in our clinical practice. I seem to be seeing much more of NTM in my clinical practice as compared to what I did five years ago. So tell me what you think are the reasons for this increased incidence globally and then in India. I think first and foremost region which you have already, uh, of course, explained, that is the increasing awareness and increasing tools and the sensitivity and the specificity of the tools for the diagnosis. Uh, these are the two regions. Another thing is that the Indian data, Indian epidemiology, Indian aesthetics is, uh, of course, uh, that is not uh, widely available. You have also seen, I have also seen in your presentation also. As a byproduct of different studies, there are few data is available. For example, in from our King George Medical University, uh, we did uh, a, a, a thesis, PhD thesis on extra pulmonary tuberculosis. And I would uh, share that data that uh, during that study of my PhD student, one of the brilliant PhD students now had become faculty member in one of the AIMS, rather I would say AIMS Bhopal. He's the microbiologist and uh, one of the leading rising star of microbiologist in the in country. So he was my PhD student and he did an extra pulmonary tuberculosis samples, a lot of drug resistance profile, a lot of uh, molecular and genetic profile and of course part of the Nantium also. So in that time, probably that was the uh, the uh, uh, years from 2009 to 2015. And from this study, we could found that only 1% of our sample, they could found be positive as NTM. So that was the coincidence or that was a just uh, isolate, which we isolated, we didn't know. So that was the byproduct of our study. That was the not many study sure. which was targeted for the NTM, that was a byproduct of the study. And more so over data, they are, if you talk of the microbials, I think Dr. Sudarshan will, of course, throw light more properly, because most of the microbials, they have the some data as a byproduct. Secondly, only few microbiological centers in India, they have the facility 
to diagnose the antigen that is also a big issue now the first time our national net tuberculosis elimination has program this has taken antigen into their fold first time so i think sure. the, after 4 5 years when this uh, this uh, program will throw the data then of course we will have the idea and you are sure. really of course appreciable that in short span of time in a very two common 15 20 uh, slides you have given overview of ntm and overall we can see we can benefit our chess council of india members that uh, the elderly people the people with underlying lung disease or people with immunocompromised states sure. these are the people who are having frequent repeated infections and routinely whatever the treatment you are giving for example you have treated anti tubercular treatment for example you have treated the secondary bacterial infection yeah. and still people are coming with recurrent infection and these are the patient where you have to suspect that yes these can be presumptive cases of ntm and then of course yeah. you have to follow and not only simple is somebody asked in the chat box what is the role of uh, montu stex what is the role of sputum for ab no role you see these are the <laughs> the the tools which you can have the added additional tool or ancillary tool for the routine diagnosis of tuberculosis not for the micro the ntm environmental bacteria the basically you need the specialist microbiology sure. lab a specialized microbiology lab and of course expert microbiologist then only you yeah. can diagnose and sure. you need a good clinician who is re really exposed experienced and sensitized for the uh, yeah. presumptive diagnosis of the ntm so that yeah. is the only thank way to approach so, so these are the my some opening yeah. remarks i would say thank you so much dr suryakant so all very valid points uh, i mean i i you agreed with me i think other people on the panel would also agree that probably the presence of the cb net platform when we are trying to look for tb is one of the factors which has actually increased our understanding and recognition of uh, ntm so that brings me to the uh, dr devkishor gupta to so devkishor uh, we'll come to the question about cb net etc i have lots of questions myself that i want to ask you and i'm sure the audience have to uh but before that i spoke about these large number of species you know 170 odd species of uh, non tuberculous mycobacteria so these are aerobic non motile acid fast bacteria which are ubiquitous in soil and water and i spoke about some of these some of these species which seem to cause more of disease as compared to just contamination or infection what is your in, uh, perspective i mean i'm sure you see much more of ntm like dr surya khan said as compared to what we do being in the lab so what are the important bugs are they the same as it is for the rest of the globe what is it that makes you sit up and think okay this is something where i need to ring up the clinician and tell them that we found this and we need to initiate treatment quickly so some thoughts dev kishor dev kishor yeah, you definitely yeah, yeah. yeah definitely yeah there are multiple species but not all these pathogens are not all these um, entms are pathogenic as you rightly said I mean, largely, if you look into the literature, I mean, definitely MAC, MFM complex, Kansas C, Zenop, Zulgai, Simi, abscesses, Fortuitum. These are the you know largely isolated pathogens. But if you look into the diagnostic platform, uh, generally thirty-two. So twenty to thirty-two are the you know there are some evidence or other that these can be pathogenic. So largely, these twenty to thirty-two numbers are what we look look out for in by diagnostics. and coming to the gene yeah sorry and and as you rightly so again we'll come to the yeah. yeah we'll come to the gene expert in a bit dev kishor but i'll just push you right. a little bit more so yes you've said 32 you've said 20 but you also mentioned zulgai simi etc on one side and you mentioned the abscesses yeah. you mentioned the avm intracellular etc so when you're giving a report when you're issuing a report i think dr surya khan talked about the challenges about species identification only done in certain reference labs throughout the country so what sort of information would you give as a microbiologist i know the clinician will correlate the disease process with the bug that you isolate but you yeah. know would you say if you find avm intracellular would you say this would probably mandate treatment active treatment versus something like a zulgai or a simi where you said please correlate clinically and might not need treatment yeah. is that something that the microbiologist would no, do or no absolutely Ab absolutely so definitely uh, i mean the treatment protocol i mean the diagnostic protocol is when there is diagnostic and clinical and radiological evidence so at least two cultures from 
two separate expected scutums uh, should be positive. So that's number one. And if you go for bronchial loash or lavage, one is enough. And if there is histologic evidence, definitely you can strive for one culture. So that's fine. That's under well understood. But again, from the diagnostic point of view, one thing that where you need expertise that you have to, you know, use one uh, reagent called NALC in acetylcysteine. So there you have to strike a balance. If you, if you use higher concentration, you may be happy that there's not much of contamination. But again, in that course, you might kill. So you have to strike a balance. So there comes the technical skill that you have to isolate the right uh, uh, appropriate NTM. And secondly, you have to select the right media. So if you look into the literature, so solid media is still preferred for NTM uh, diagnosis, NTM isolation. But unfortunately, most of the labs do not use solid media. And CLSI recently uh, mentioned few other media which is which are again solid. So these are certain things that we have to keep in mind. But again, there are certain diagnostic advances like Malditoff MS mass spectrometry, which is going to revolutionize. And we have a lot of installations in the country already. And also in the public sector, private sector, especially in the public sector, AIMS and other premier hospitals. So this actually facilitated the identification of NTMs quite easy. And although there are certain dis, uh, areas where it's still, uh, I mean, you know, these uh, molecular assays are helpful, uh, but largely the diagnostic challenges are mitigated to a great extent with the advent of newer technologies like, you know, Malditoff mass spectrometry, and definitely we have molecular tests. But the challenges with molecular tests, again, as I said, it's a preparation phase and also it needs sophisticated infrastructure. So that's the challenge. That's why you do not have enough, uh, you know, capacity building capacity in uh, all, all parts of the country. Sure. So the implication, I'll, I'll sort of have got another question for you. So suppose I have someone who's got bronchiectasis, chronically damaged lung, this features of traction bronchiectasis on a CT. It's a thin asthenic patient, right? And the patient comes up coughing blood. So I have a clinical suspicion that this might be NTM. Does mentioning that to you as the microbiologist, if I'm sending the sample across to you, does mentioning the fact that this might be NTM make you use a different culture media or culture in a different way? Does that actually help the microbiologist or would you do it anyway, irrespective, depending on what you find on the CBNAT or gene expert? It's a great question. Actually, when you have suspicion, it's always best when you report that you report to the lab, because when you suspect NTM, we need different media at times, and also we need different incubation temperature. So it's different from rapid grower, growers and you know these uh, slow growers. So this piece of information, clinical information that you are actually suspecting NTM, can play havoc in the identification, rather isolation of NTM in the lab. Okay, great. That's good to know. Let me let me get uh, Dr. Radha Munja in. Didi, um, uh, welcome. Very nice to see you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about transmission of NTM? Human to human transmission, I mentioned very briefly in my talk, but uh, your thoughts about human to human transmission, or do you think it's always why the environment in the patients that you've seen in your vast experience? Um, thank you, Raja, uh, for... Uh the question as well as uh, welcoming me here. My sincere apologies to you and the audience if you find disturbance from my side, as I've said, uh, I was taken up for uh, some other work which I could not uh, avoid. Uh, coming back to the transmission, as we all know uh, that NTM are ubiquitous, they are soil organisms, they are everywhere, you know, and uh, because uh, the structure of these uh, NTM are almost similar to the MTB that we come across. So they have a very, you know, tough uh, cell wall. So the routine uh, disinfectants that you use uh, would not make them non-viable or would not kill them. So basically the transmission would be from the environment in one way or the other. And uh, once they find the soil, as you know, the seed grows when the soil. So if there is an immunocompromised sure. person or somebody who already has damaged lungs, bronchiectatic changes already there, then it's very easy for them to grow. In fact, what I think is that they would also go grow in a patient of tuberculosis who have been treated very well, but uh, have a residual damage in the lungs. So we have to be aware about that. When we go to the literature, the literature says that it is not transmitted from person to person. But 
we as clinicians know that it is the aerosol that is the infection which comes out like a, a, an infected person coughs sneezes it could come out and the aerosols are there so i personally feel that uh, it cannot be said that it does not cause human to human transmission i can't vouch 100% what comes to my mind when you look at the literature is that most of the time these organisms are in the walls you know like uh, the necrotic tissue or in the walls of for uh, the damaged lungs or they themselves cause uh, cavitary lesions and all so probably they are not coming out in large numbers to cause infection that is one idea which comes to my mind but we have a very able microbiologist as well as all my panelists here and uh, they can also give an input that why the literature says that person to person transmission does not occur i feel that uh, it's quite possible and we are not very far when we would prove that also and we may have uh, cases reporting all this we have actually not studied systematically and as the number of uh, ntm i mean the cases itself i'm not talking about reporting but the occurrence itself sure. is increasing now the number prevalence is increasing so i think that uh, it's quite possible if somebody who comes across these aerosols or in, inhales them and already has damaged lungs or is immunocompromised it's it may not occur from person to person in a healthy adult but if the it's immunocompromised has underlying damaged lungs i'm sure some amount of person to person transmission does occur even in ntm sure i mean that's what the literature uh, current literature also says didi so it says that you can have person to person transmission but via the environment and it talks about the aerosol route as being an example of patient to patient transmission through the environment so you yeah, absolutely bang on so completely agreed i think the literature has also evolved like our thoughts have and you have very nicely mentioned that as we go forward we will have more of person to person uh, transmission through the environment So thank you. Let me get uh, Dr. Sudarshan Pothel. Sudarshan, welcome. Uh, very nice to see you. Um, thank you. Thank you, sir. So Sudarshan, about the pathogenesis of the <clears throat> disease. Um, tell us in very simple terms, briefly about the pathogenesis. And you know, a brief mention. Uh, we are going to discuss mainly about pulmonary disease uh, today, but we also know that there is extra pulmonary NTM. So a little mention about what extra pulmonary sites. in the perspective of the pathogenesis of this disease process so that's but right uh, basically uh, in ntm uh, yeah, if you analyze the histopathological study of both ntm as well as tuberculosis almost similar that's why we we presume that uh, the substantially similarity pathogenesis uh, of uh, tuberculosis versus ntm for mycobacterial uh, cell mediated immunity is the main mode of defense whenever i particularly when about as uh, my previous speaker already told the ma main mode of uh, spread is inhal in my inhalation that's why inhalation uh, uh, ntm encountered by particularly by main cell is alveolar uh, macrophages ntm are taken up by primarily uh, phagosomes that fused with uh, vacuoles in phagocyte cytoplasm the main uh, next cell particularly other than uh, alveolar macrophages is t lymphocytes so whenever these t lymphocytes uh, particularly ma uh, macrophages uh, process the mycobacterial antigen and present them to t lymphocyte by which there is expansion of uh, t lymphocyte clones which are the basis uh, of acquired immune response as well as immunological memory due to this immunological memory whatever the memory the montox stress comes positive uh, two important cytokines particularly interleukin 12 and uh, interferon gamma these are, uh, are secreted uh, from the these inflammatory cells which are main responsible for the uh, killing of this or any sort of uh, granuloma formation due to the ntm uh, so at this point of time at one important things i want to highlight here that uh, main cellular response is from macrophages and t lymphocytes yeah. and main role of cytokines is interleukin 12 tnf alpha and interferon gamma as well as there so is what, some 
So, yes, Dr. Yes, Pukhal, yes. just one question in that perspective. Yes. You, yes, so, how is this different to TB? Is this exactly the same? Is this different in any way? How is the pathogen? In simple terms, is there a distinction between the two or is it more or less the same pathogenesis for both? It is more or less same to the like tuberculosis. But the important thing is and because I have explained that this of the cellular response as, as, as well as the role of cytokines. But uh, the person got those having genetic defect of any immune factor by disturbing sure. these cascades are more prone for the atypical mycobacterium. But yeah. the pathogenic is almost, almost similar to the like tuberculosis. Sure. And a line about extrapulmonary uh, NTM, uh, Dr. Pothal? Actually, extrapulmonary uh, NTM pathogenesis is almost uh, like that, uh, similar. similar to the pulmonary. Sure. Almost similar to the right. pulmonary. Okay. Only, okay. only the difference is that in pulmonary, there is a lack of some local defense uh, mechanism like the previous uh, uh, say structural damage of the lung. That's why. Right. Sure. Thank you. Uh, very, very nicely and very simply explained. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pothal. So let me bring uh, Tarang in. Um, so Tarang, uh, if you can uh, switch your video on for a moment. Yeah, great. It's always uh, great to see Tarang. I don't get to see Tarang as often as I used to at one point of time. So welcome. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Tarang, a little bit about the two different varieties of disease I spoke about in the presentation initially. So fibronodular versus fibrocavitary. I want to know from you is why these two different varieties are they actually different in different phenotypes of patients? And if you could characterize a sort of continuation with Dr. What Dr. Pothel said about extrapulmonary, whereabouts extrapulmonary and what manifestation briefly. Okay. So largely pulmonary disease with NTM can be uh, classified into nodular bronchiectatic type and the fibrocavitary type. So these are two distinct phenotypes. Nodular bronchiectatic phenotype generally would be presenting more like non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. These would be elderly females with cuff and they generally are also associated with having similar body types. So these patients would have scoliosis, they would be, they would be tall and thin, uh, a significant proportion also have, has uh, pectus excavatum. Uh, uh, on the contrary, fibrocavitary disease generally presents, presents like tuberculosis. Now, these patients would have a lot more systemic uh, symptoms. It is more common in males. And usually all of these patients would have a history of underlying disease like emphysema, COPD, or a previous history of tuberculosis. Now the phenotypes are not, just don't have presentation significance, but they also have a prognostic significance because the mortality rates are way higher when it comes to the fibrocavitary disease. Now this is specifically important when you are trying to choose who to treat and who not to treat. So I would be more uh, you know, inclined towards treating my fibrocavitary as compared to my nodular bronchiectatic phenotypes. So these are the two large phenotypes that we that we generally see. And uh, as far as the uh, second question is concerned, sir, about the uh, extra yeah. pulmonary. So before that, so, sorry, Taran. So before that, let me sort of uh, push you a little bit more. You said nodular variety, more of bronchiectasis, fibrocavitary disease, more of other chronic lung disease. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes. COPD. Yeah. So we think that patients with bronchiectasis who get NTM, probably have a better prognosis overall as compared to other chronic lung diseases? Or do you think there's overlap between the chronic lung diseases and the fibrocavitary versus fibronodular types? So, yes, sir. So, the uh, I feel the, uh, the explanation behind that is that patients with fibrocavitary disease al already have a very significant underlying airways disease or a post-TB status. So, the lung, uh, the lung, the, the lung function and all is not really that great. I think that is the reason these guys have a higher mortality and this has to be taken into consideration. Whereas nodular bronchiectasis phenotype, these, these present would uh, just present as a case of bronchiectasis, like your 35-year-old female who sure. recently... Yeah, okay. And uh, a line about extrapulmonary, I mean, just a mention maybe about lymph nodes and surgical sites, I think that would be valuable uh, for the audience. So yeah. just a line about extrapulmonary. So extra pulmonary to the NTM disease, lymphadenitis, more common in children. It is mostly seen in under under five years of age. And uh, whereas the other sites are generally by direct inoculation. So in the West, they take history about gardening or using showers and all. 
uh, in our in our set of generally history of farming and all should be taken into consideration similarly surgical sites abdominal sites and uh, when there is really not good sterilization of instruments you could generally have direct inoculation of ntm which could actually give a non healing uh, surgical wound yeah and uh, again the challenge tarang is about treating these patients isn't it we won't go into treatment just now but whether you incidentally find an ntm in a node whether you find it on a surgical incision site and what you do is a challenge because this is even more refractory to treatment in my understanding as compared to what ntm lung disease is so um, uh, challenging treatment for extra pulmonary but we won't dwell into that for long because that's probably outside the ambit of what we are discussing today dr surya khan let me get you back in again um okay so yeah grant so yeah. dot yeah dr surya khan i've got a question yeah. for you which is sort of um, very much in line with uh, what post graduate trainees get asked and what they want to know so yeah. we have spoken a little bit about the correlation of chronic lung disease and ntm and we have mentioned yeah. bronchiectasis we have mentioned copd i'm sure yeah. you could probably broaden the spectrum a little bit more and talk about other chronic lung diseases and then in bronchiectasis this various conditions syndromes etc which seem to predispose to this combination or unholy nexus between bronchiectasis and ntm so your thoughts conditions etc would be very valuable for uh, all the listeners and for us uh so at a tertiary care center in king george medical university in collaboration with our department of microbiology whatever we have experienced in last few years that is the most common even more common with bronchitis is the most common thing when we have to suspect as a preemptive case of ntm is a case rather cases of post tubercular sequelae where ye where the most of the part or the either the one lung or even both lung they are damaged sure. broadly damaged so destroyed lung fibrotic lung cavitatory lung most commonly as a part of post tubercular sequelae because in last few years as a part of a study of topd and so many my special interest in post tubercular sequelae we have now become very wiser to suspect ntm in first post tubercular sequelae cases so if we can do the, the really epidemiological study in india i think and our experience shows that post tubercular sequelae are the cases and i used to teach my resident that whenever you are admitting hospitalization sure. the hospitalizing a case of post tubercular sequelae always suspect the ntm number one number 2 as mentioned that yes bronchiectasis is a well known established uh, of course is a fact that yes bronchiectasis patient can have more vulnerability for developing ntm infections and a patient of bronchiectasis who in recent past has developed more exacerbations more frequently uh, secondary infection presenting with you in your emergency department or with the oxygen desaturation then this is also the case when you should rule out the ntm the third thing is uh, about the cavitary disease yes so in cavitary disease once you have ruled out by simple uh, sputum for afb that yes afb is negative and you are confident that yes even with comparing to the previous chest x ray there is no additional lesion no active lesion then of course such type of patient they should be uh, suspected for the uh, ntm so that's why usually i Uh, uh teach to my residents also and i think uh, this input i can give to my cci sure. members also yeah so dr surya kant only one point yeah. you mentioned um sputum may be negative you mean sputum may yeah. be negative positive but the gene expert being negative right yeah gene expert is negative yeah, yeah. gene expert yeah. Yeah. correct because we are we are doing the uh, uh, yeah. i mean uh, now sputum have for ab has become a, a routine part is not a specific yeah. means the the, sure. the yeah sure. cbn yeah 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 so i'll come to you tarang i was actually going sure. to come to you so you are uh, not long ago the national uh, quiz uh, champion for uh, india <laughs> so um, i want you to tell us a little bit about the syndromes you know the lady windermere syndrome etc which come with bronchiectasis a mention and um, conditions along with bronchiectasis the part of this question yes sir so uh, we generally lady windermere syndrome sir it's basically bronchiectasis and you know uh, uh, retained uh, so ntm infections involving the right middle lobe and the lingula 
so this generally would be uh, more common with the nodular bronchiectatic type of uh, of or bronchiectasis then the uh, with bronchiectasis the different syndromes are cartagenous syndrome and the young syndrome so yeah. cartagenous syndrome would have the situs inversus and bronchiectasis and of course uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia which actually uh, is also a part of the syndromes so so one one thing that uh, i was when i was going through this uh, i stumbled upon a study which actually said that patients with ntm have uh, a slower ciliary beating frequency and lower nitric oxide levels and so this actually had led to use uh, people using sildenafil as a mode of modality of treatment with 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 ntm infections these patients also had a sort of impaired penetrance of cftr gene mutation as well so i think this is more of the western data where with cystic fibrosis they are seeing a lot of ntm so sir what was the data with us when we did the embark india registry did we have a lot of ntm with uh, with bronchiectasis so we had about 16 patients from memory in the 2195 patients where we actually isolated ntm which was about 2.5% of the total number of patients where we isolated a bug so oh. that's just to say that the numbers are not high but they are there and most of mm. what we found was abscesses and avm intracellulare with maybe a couple of patients having cancer so that was the distribution of embark india and i i'm not sure whether the sluggishness of the cilia and the nitric oxide levels that you spoke about uh, is a part of the pcd diagnosis which we tend to miss along with isolation of ntm or whether it's ntm per se which causes a problem with the cilia beat etc so i'm i'm not sure but uh, i think it's food for thought for sure yes so thanks for that lovely the syndromes have been covered so i'll come to uh, uh, dr radha munji again so didi we spoke a little bit about the fact that there are certain conditions where you actually expect to find ntm you know you sort of uh, when your index of suspicion is high so what are the signs and symptoms which make you think of ntm and if are there conditions where you actually write to your microbiologist i am thinking of ntm here please try and see whether you can grow ntm or not didi dr radha munje you are on mute i think few of the things have already been covered by the dr tarang and uh, even dr suryakant has mentioned it uh, I, i would like to go a little sequentially so for example there is a diagnosed case of tuberculosis and you have put the patient on treatment and as you know if the patient is not responding in a way which you expect or predict by giving an appropriate regime uh, you start thinking of many things whether the drug levels are appropriate or not whether there is drug resistance but when we are talking on the platform of ntm we have we have assumed that all these things are taken care of and still patient continues to be symptomatic and direct smear is positive and as we know sibinat may be negative this is the time when you suspect ntm and as has been earlier told by the panel a panelist in our own platform uh, that uh, whenever you are suspecting ntm you should write on the forms and as it is even if you are referring to a microbiologist i'm sure very few of the microbiologists are offering uh, the services or, or or rather looking into it personally and uh, putting the sample for appropriate cultures so that is one part of it then secondly as dr suryakant has said that those who already have sequelae and if the person continues to be symptomatic and there may not be any radio am i audible yes uh, uh, if there e uh, the symptoms are persistent and uh, there are repeated exacerbations there may not be radiological deterioration because they do not deteriorate uh, very fast when they uh, colonize the uh, already uh, you know damaged lungs so that is second part of it third is as dr tarang has already been uh, talking about the nodular phenotype and the fibro cavity or the cavity phenotype and there is a wonderful study which says that they have, have done a sequential follow up of this uh, nodular phenotype and looking into it whether the these patients uh, really do they deteriorate or in which way and do they need treatment and though they uh, they develop the disease or deteriorate very slowly a uh, a good watch on various parameters including the ct score is very important in a follow up so if the ct score is increasing 
that is the time sure. when uh, you should go in insist on cultures identify the ntm and uh, uh, of course go ahead with the treatment so that is the second part of it yeah uh, uh, then the third one is uh, i'm just now talking only about the clinical scenario and sure. not the presentation and the third most important is as we have been talking about extra pulmonary sites and among these two sites are very important one is the lymph nodes which have persistent draining not only the lymph nodes but abscesses and sinuses which are not healing that is sure. one and the surgical lesions the scar which is not healing and has multiple discharging sinuses these are all the areas where you should be suspecting ntm and sending the samples so uh, yeah. this is Ren. what i feel is a, a clinical scenario yeah. to suspect yeah so brilliant message is dr radha munje so i think um, when you see someone who's asthenic malnourished male yes. uh, scoliosis i think uh, tarang spoke about uh, yes. tall high arched palate these individuals with a background of chronic lung disease maybe with a background of immunocompromise maybe with multiple comorbidities don't just think tb think about ntm put that on the form make sure written that and the other point i liked very much from what you uh, said dr radha munje is about these non healing wounds incision sites etc think whether it might be ntm which is causing it and in some cases you would isolate it if you think about it so strong messages quickly come to you tarang and i'm asking you this question because i asked you the nodular versus fibrocavitary question um, a little while ago so briefly chest x ray and ct what do you expect to find and we have actually discussed what we find but what is it on the chest x ray and ct which makes you think along with the clinical collaboration collaboration could this be ntm yeah. so two things on chest x ray sir very quickly reticonodular shadows uh, and along with that we also get a clue of of an underlying disease so uh, features like emphysema features like uh, cavities fibrosis would actually prompt me uh, to get a diagnosis of of ntm on the ct scan generally again back to the phenotypes nodular bronchiectasis you would have bilateral multifocal bronchiectasis with changes of bronchiolitis which would present itself as tree in bud pattern there would be nodules and the classic appearance would be in the right middle lobe and the lingula similarly in the fibrocavitary the, the changes would be just like tuberculosis upper lobe fibrocavitary changes with apical pleural thickening there are two more changes that actually don't get talked about that that often uh, one is a solitary pulmonary nodule so there are two uh, generally studies from south korea which talk about that about these nodules which were initially biopsied for a suspicion of malignancy which came out to be uh, ntm and the second is hypersensitive pneumonitis definitely possible hot tub lung as a hypersensitive mycobacterium avm i think this is what generally the radiology of sure. uh, of ntm would look like sure and uh, interestingly you asked me about embark a little while ago taram so um, in embark the most of the ntm that we found was actually right middle lobe disease so you know that's interesting that even in the indian sub population it's a small number and you cannot draw conclusions shouldn't draw conclusions from it but the right middle lobe was by far the most affected in ntm disease even in india 70% 70% yeah. yeah yeah correct yeah dr radha munje please um Uh, i i hope uh, that you are, everybody here does not scold me for my input but uh, when i when we are talking about this right middle lobe involvement we should have uh, thought whether these are the areas which were either already affected by tuberculosis because this is a common site which is earlier are noted in the earlier literature also and then it get colonized with ntm because uh, sure i i think we should also keep that in mind yeah okay wonderful so let me go to uh, dr pothal again so dr pothal we've spoken about this already but i want this reemphasized from your side you know so we spoke about three different samples we spoke about sputum we spoke about bal and we spoke about tblb or histological diagnosis how would you position each of these individually where would you actually go ahead and do a bal rather than just depending on sputum and how do you actually sort of large cci audience which is listening to us today how would you position these three different samples and where would you put them yes uh, 
Nice question. Uh, first of all, definitely, uh, whatever that we have studied, or we have uh, two types of particularly fibro cavitary or nodular. So for the fibro cavitary variety, definitely sputum is the best. As you know, like tuberculosis also, the uh, the amount of sputum expectation is better in fibro cavitary. That's why the sputum could be the ideal sample for fibro cavitary. But where is about the nodular variety or bronchiectasis variety? So at times, uh, say, uh, may not be the ideal sample for the sputum. That's why it has been said that uh, definitely sputum is the best sample for the as a sample. But uh, some variety of patient, particularly those are not able to expect it properly. Or uh, in spite of uh, you are clinically suspecting uh, uh, highly of NTM, but we are not getting uh, sputum and our uh, sputum often negative for the culture. In that case, you may prefer bile sample. But the important thing is that, that uh, uh, whenever we are preferring the bile sample, it is, as, as you know, that uh, is the, one of the commonest uh, environmental organisms. That's why we, have, we, are, we have to very much uh, 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 sure about the prevent the contamination of the sample. But uh, think is that uh, based on the previous study, it has been seen that uh, small study, the bal sample uh, probably having uh, say better yield than the sputum. But uh, based on the large study, it has been seen that uh, there is no difference between the sputum versus bal sample. But uh, what you were told about the TBLB, uh, probably TBLB is not exactly the ideal choice uh, for any type of sample. However, uh, because if you go through the your uh, diagnostic algorithm, that uh, TBLB sample, our uh, though uh, histopathologically is almost similar to the tuberculosis, that's why again we need culture. That's why TBLB may not be the choice. Yes, very rarely. Suppose uh, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, say. Uh, in addition to NTN, uh, we are suspecting some other disease. Suppose in addition to NTM, some uh, uh, SPN, uh, I mean to say solidary proline nodule or some malignancy. In that case, uh, TBLB may be, the, may be the alternate choice, but it is a rarely indicated rather. Sure. Sure. So very nicely classified, uh, Dr. Pothel. I love the way you put, th put the three different diagnostic algorithms. So I think... TBLB finding NTM is more incidental. Exactly. You probably did the NTM for something. You probably did the biopsy for something else exactly. and you sent it for culture and you grew NTM. I think that's probably the only way where you find it in TBLB. For the others, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I have often found that these patients do not produce a lot of phlegm. Even with fibrocavitary disease, they don't uh, uh, produce a lot of phlegm. And this criteria of having two different sputum samples separately coming back as positive probably pushes me in the direction of getting a bal done in these patients on a lot of occasions. It is not evidence-based, but I'm just telling you what I would do in my clinical practice. I, I probably depend more on a bal rather than sputum samples for the diagnosis in line with what you said already. Okay, in uh, uh, in another view, what can be held? Suppose patients are not able to expect it properly the sputum, uh, we can have a mechanism like induced sputum mechanism by sure. giving any uh, sure. uh, any sort of a three percent NaCl or a beta two yeah. NaCl, so that it will be also sure. better option. Uh, it's because uh, it is a non non invasive technique. That's why. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Suryakant has a point. Dr. Yeah. Suryakant, please. Yeah, rather actually I'm uh, convinced with both of you, rather in the, our department in King George Medical University, we have made a departmental protocol that whenever some consultant or senior resident has suspected NTM, actually NTM is a very shy type of uh, bacteria. So always this is our protocol, departmental protocol that take the sample of BAL and also the post bronchoscopy sputum sample. So yeah. these are the two samples which as a protocol we are uh, giving the microbiology yeah. people and microbiology people are also very much happy that uh, you people are doing wonderful job, you are do doing yeah. our uh, job very easy. So I think that can be a message that whenever you are suspecting the NTM, please take a bronchial lava sample and also the post bronchoscopy sputum sample. So yeah. these two samples usually we process. I completely agree with you, uh, Dr. Suryakant. I think um, I agree with Dr. Pothal that uh, induced sputum is a way. But, you know, trying to get two valid induced sputum samples and then trying to grow 
non-tuberculous mycobacterium in them might actually be a challenge. So uh, I think we don't have a written protocol, but I guess I would actually bronch most of my patients who where I'm suspecting NTM or where I, I'm trying to obtain a diagnosis of NTM. Um, so wonderful. I can see Dev Kishore's hands. I'll come to you, Dev Kishore. Um, Dr. Gupta, if you can put your video on. Um, I raise my hand way. because, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. So you make a point and I have got a few questions for you after. So you make your point and then I'll ask the questions. Yeah. I raise my hand because my flight is about to change. I just want right. to tell that, you know, you have, you have a suspicion of NTM when you're positive, but gene expert is negative, but there is an off-level interpretation in gene expert, although your report may be negative, but if you look into this melt curves and everything, you can often you can see RPUB being detected. So this is an insight and there is enough literature based on that, that if RPUB2 is detected, but your overall gene expert MTB is negative, this can give you a suspicion that possibly you're dealing with an NTM. And on top of that, if you deal, if you get a, a B positive in smear, so I mean, nothing like that. So this is some insight. Yeah, now, over, yeah, now. And uh, species identification, I didn't realize you were in a flight, Dev Kishore. I thought you were in a lab. So, <laughs> so thank you for no, joining no. in. But uh, quickly, species identification, yeah. you know, species. how important is it? How do we go about doing it? Give us some insights. Absolutely. So species identification is absolutely important because many a times the treatment regimen is based on species. And uh, as I said, that MALDITOF from uh, mass spectrometry is actually a very good uh, platform for that. And other than that, we have line probasive, which is again widely available in our, in our country. But again, for NTM is not very much used. So line probasive, there are two varieties. One is this liquid array and another is DNA strip technology. So these two can actually identify 20, 32 pathogens, 32 types of NTMs uh, from sputum culture. And there is another test on line probase, which is from direct sputum sample. So that can detect 20 types of NTMs. And also there is another test which can uh, detect the, these resistance genes. So sp especially macrolides and amicacin, aminoglycosides. So all these platforms are available. And not only that, from Thermo Fisher, there is a test called Sensititer. So it's a broth micro dilution that's again recommended by CLSA. So that's also a wonderful test to, you know, uh, make you aware about the other an anti-tubercular drugs like linezolate, clofazimin, and etc. So which brings you to my, my last, I'll let you go after this, uh, Dev Kishore, but uh, is it actually required to do sensitivity on anything other than macrolides and aminoglycoside in the NTM spectrum? Uh, my understanding of the literature is if you those two do those two drugs, you're more or less sorted because there's a commonality between the treatment for the rest. Yeah, absolutely. If you if you are, I mean, lucky to get sensitive, uh, then it's fine. You may stop there. But again, there's certain fine tuning which is required for abscesses. Like you know, if, sure. if macrolide sensitivity is there, but you know, there's a prolonged treatment of, it, it takes around 14 days to check the inducible macrolide resistance. Otherwise, you can go for sequencing to check for ERM40 or 41 gene. So these are certain finer insights which can help you while you treat your patient. Although apparently macrolide may be sensitive, but other than that, when you come across resistances, certainly you may have to uh, know other uh, drugs. But, but but for cancer, see, like, you know, rifampicin and other antitubercular drugs are important. So for that, you might need to uh, check other other antitubercular drug sensitivity testing. Sure. How many minutes to go before your flight takes off, Deep Kishore? Four minutes. Four minutes. So yeah. one question in the question box, and I'll ask you first, and then I'll go to my colleagues. It's a question which I think is um, actually touches a lot of what we have discussed. So one of our colleagues in the chat box says, I'm suffering from mycobacterium abscesses. I got it after my inguinal hernia surgery. The mesh got infected. The mesh is removed now, but there are abdominal sinuses where from which there is drainage. Sorry, I lost it for a minute. Yeah. So there are sin abdominal sinuses that are not improving. What should I do? Do I, do I go for another surgery? Do I need to add in drugs? So we'll ignore the surgical bit again just now. But I th wondered about your thoughts. We're talking abscesses. Do you think this is going to be more like adding in something like cefoxetin, clofazimin, um, bedaquilin? Do you think we should go for the reserve drugs here? What do we tell our colleague 
as further could be, could be. again this is one one beautiful situation where you can actually quickly identify uh, abscesses which is a rapid rapid grower and in both for this full uh, susceptibility testing and you can check the other antitubercular drugs but again i i before i go into the treatment part and this susceptibility part i should begin with uh, you know that infection prevention is very key thing here so that's really unfortunate and we often see a lot of surgical site infection which are because of you know non tubercular mycobacteria that's be because of poor disinfection practices and other stuff so that is something sure. we should actually there's a good platform Absolutely. to you know tell everybody Strong and message. certainly this is one 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 example where you should go for you know full all out susceptibility testing because of it often often needs yeah. prolonged duration of treatment sure so he's done that there are only three drugs which he's been on for a while amikacin linezolid and azithromycin so he said he's done a sensitivity screen and those are the drugs to which he's sensitive so um, yeah. yeah so i think reserve drugs would be the way forward isn't right, it right 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 linezolid um, often helps very well yeah. linezolid often helps yeah so uh, let me ask uh, that's five dev kishore thank you so much i'm really touched that you joined us from the flight i thank have uh, actually never hosted a meeting on cci with someone sat on a flight so that's a new one for me thank it's, you very much for joining it's a privilege thank you so much it's an honor to be invited thank you so much thank wish you, you all so the much. best thank you so yeah. much so dr surikant quick question yeah. so our colleague also asks about surgery yes. and for me i think surgery would be pro probably a valid option here because yes. to eradicate this bug would actually otherwise be a challenge in my book so your thoughts to dr surika yeah actually what happens in chronic sinuses there are a, a repeated epithelialization and in chronic sinuses hardly any antitubercular drugs reach there there is a lack of concentration of effective concentration of the drug into the sinuses and that's why surgery is the preferred method of eradication of these bugs so i would suggest my dear friend uh, 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 who has developed the after this uh, uh, this ntm after the surgery hernia surgery that please just consult your surgeon and of course have the sinus surgery that is the only way out and of course post surgery you have to continue whatever the susceptibility pattern you have so you continue with that but surgery should be done on priority basis yeah grand so we'll uh, come to come to drugs in a moment but um, uh, dr krishna has talked about the fact that ntm treated with regular atd without knowing the diagnosis often heals yeah. and that is because the rifampicin and ethambutol are a part of the normal atd regime so i completely agree with him i think yeah. in the non cbnat days non gene expert days a lot of the patients would get treated just on the basis of an afb smear and there you would have a lot of ntm hiding in which would heal because you've given the rifampicin and the thambutol to which it is actually responded so a fair and important point uh, that you made there yes and uh, not only that but uh, luckily at that time the treatment was more than uh, almost 18 months yes sure so that took sure. care of uh, probably ntm <laughs> sure Sure. Um, let's speed up a little bit. I've got about ten minutes, and I've got some audience questions that I need answered. So let me come to Dr. Pothal. So Dr. Pothal, Mycobacterium avium intracellularis. So MAC infection. How would you diagnose? Diagnostic yes, uh, criteria, simplistically for the audience. Okay. Uh, think is that uh, already uh, you have uh, uh, described in your presentation, but still. Uh, Uh, i am telling by uh, four things which important it is a logic behind this uh, one is clinical second is radiological third is exclusion and fourth is microbiological so age already you have described that uh, trying to avoid that transient contamination definitely we need more sample at least uh, two sample of sputum or a bile sample second so, thing is uh, age you have your uh, described your in your presentation we want to treat the disease not the infection that's why we need clinical means uh, both symptoms of pulmonary symptoms as well as systemic symptoms simultaneously radiological symptom age already discussed so in total first uh, patient should have clinical symptoms both pulmonary as well as systemic The radiological features means based on either X-ray or HRCT. In X-ray, particularly either nodular or cavitary lesion. In HRCT, either in form of bronchiectasis or with multiple small nodules. Third part is exclusion of other diagnoses, particularly tuberculosis and fungal diseases. Fourth and fourth most vital is culture, microbiological. 
for the microbiological diagnosis, uh, two sample necessary for sputum and one sample necessary for bile. Third part about the TBLB, though histopathologically look like granuloma, still we need culture. That's all about the diagnosis yeah. of mark infection. So absolutely crystal clear. Uh, thank you for repeating those, Dr. Pothal. I don't have to summarize. You have said it very nicely. Um, let me come to Dr. Radha Munje. Dr. Radha Munje, what helps you to decide between treating and not treating an NTM infection? We have said this a few times now, but I want you to just give us the headlines for our youngsters in the audience today. What helps you decide whether you treat or don't treat these patients? And the duration of treatment, Dr. Radha Munche, that yes. we have not discussed, so yes. the duration. Yes. Uh, what I, I'm sure what I'm doing is just summarizing what all my friends have said. Already presented. One is a person who is symptomatic. Secondly, a person who is deteriorating radiologically. Third important is that the NTM NTM has been identified from the place, uh, from the site, uh, which is appropriate. So, for example, patient has uh, a pulmonary symptoms and you have taken a bronchoalveolar lavage or an induced sputum or post-bronchoscopic sputum. So, third is that the sample has been taken from an appropriate site. Sure. And uh, that, these, I think, are three important things. And fourth is, of course, microbiological confirmation of not only NTM, but looking at the species and uh, we need to treat that. Uh, now, when we come to the treatment duration, as uh, uh, Dr. Krishna has wisely said that uh, INH rifampicin is given and it's useful. We know that uh, few of the NTMs may need uh, different drugs. So when we are talking about mycobacterium avium intracellular recomplex or MAC, most of the time we treat with uh, clarithromycin, rifampicin and ethambutol and sure. we do not prefer to use uh, INH. And um, the treatment duration one has to remember is always, always at least 12 months after the culture has come negative. Uh, here is now uh, a very important thing like uh, say after a duration of uh, six months, if the positive uh, the isolate was from the bronchoalveolar lavage, would you again go in for bronchoscopy or would take a, a good sample? and look at the response to treatment apart from that and then look at the cultures. My my take on this would be that uh, if you have isolated it from the lavage, the best thing would be to do a lavage because I don't think it's that difficult now or uh, it should be effective, you know, like because we are going to culture. We are not just looking at the presence of organisms. And uh, once sure. the culture is negative, the treatment has to be given for 12 months. And uh, here we have to remember that uh, patient may be less symptomatic by this time and uh, would need a lot of counseling to uh, continue taking treatment because longer the treatment, uh, there would be some issues yeah. of compliance also. Very valid point. So, um, I, so what we normally do in line with what you said, Dr. Radha Munje, is to actually look at how symptomatic the patient is. And if the patient yes. is symptomatically better, you would repeat a CT at maybe six to nine months to yes. look for improvement radiologically. And if that's yes. also happened, I would go ahead and do a bal in this patient between six to yes. nine months and yes. prove culture positivity or negativity yes. as the case might be. So I uh, completely agreed. I think uh, very, very valid points. And I think we have repeated a, a few times about whom to treat and whom not to treat. Not to so we we'll leave that alone for the time being. And I'm similar lines, I come to Dr. Surya Kant. Dr. Surya Kant, can we see you? <laughs> Wonderful. So Dr. Surya Kant, MAC infection. Um, tell us a little bit about daily versus intermittent treatment. What would you favor? Why would you favor the other? And about macrolide resistance versus macrolide susceptibility in deciding treatment, which uh, Dr. Radha Munji just spoke about. Yeah. So you, I would prefer for the daily regimen, although the both regimens are, have been described. But if you see in last 20, 30 years, one thing is that doctors, they have the medical fraternity, our chest fraternity already have lost the faith in the, the intermittent regimen. 
So even the uh, National Tuberculosis Elimination Program earlier, there was an alternative regimen for the uh, pulmonary tuberculosis also, means the uh, MTB also, but that also have been withdrawn. So there is a number one, the issue of faith. Number two, whenever you you see, for a long-term therapy, you ask the patient to take on alternate day and there is some confusion. So, adherence sure. to the treatment, compliance of the treatment, that also get disturbed. So, I would prefer sure. for the daily regimen, number one. Number two, the, of course, the, if you are, uh, most of the regimens, uh, they are having the macrolide as a part and parcel of the every NTM regimen. And of course, we require now, yes, uh, drug culture susceptibility also. And preferred microlide which we are using is the clarithromycin, yes. Uh, but the, the only thing is that is the uh, now the treatment of the NTM, still the treatment of NTM is not available free of cost in the program. Patient has to buy, patient has to purchase. So I think we have to compromise somewhere because of the cost of the clarithromycin because clarithromycin sure. is a costly affair. And to add on, you see, uh, although the... Very rarely we require injectable amikacin also, but preferably if you give first three months the injectable amikacin, that wonders. So that yeah. is our uh, experience of our center that if you, in addition to it, the uh, microlite, if you give in addition to amikacin for first three months, then uh, it becomes a very effective treatment. Yeah. Um, valid point, uh, Dr. Surikant, that I feel if you have macrolide resistance, in, which is yeah. sort of seems rare in our country, then yeah. also your injectable uh, aminoglycoside yeah. for longer, the amicacin yeah. for longer, would probably be a valid way to do it. So, um, yeah. and I completely agree. I think daily treatment is something that we all do. I mean, I have uh, almost never treated people with intermittent therapy, to be honest, for the very reasons you spoke yeah. about. So, I uh, am absolutely on the same page there. Dr. Radha Munje, briefly, Cancer seed uh, infection. We spoke a little about rifampicin ethambutol INH versus yes. rifampicin ethambutol clarithromycin. What's your take? What would you give first up if you had a choice? Uh, for cancer seed, I think it's safe enough to give INH ethambutol and rifampicin provided you do not suspect INH resistance. That is my take on that. Uh, if at all you suspect INH resistance or you are in an area where INH resistance is otherwise for MTB is high, uh, then you can uh, think of uh, giving uh, the other drugs like uh, moxifloxacin, phenolones can be given. They are also good drugs. Sure. And um, if at all the yeah. patient does not respond or looking at the sensitivity pattern, you have lots of new drugs available which includes of course, what has put been put in the question is like uh, clofazamine and uh, even the newer drugs, uh, yeah. you know, can be... The beta and so on. Yeah, yes. absolutely. But the, but the uh, line which needs to be underlined is again the same thing, that uh, the treatment is 12 months after the culture is negative. Yeah, That's very absolutely. Important. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Pothal, the most difficult bug for you, which is abscesses. So mycobacterium abscesses, we all know, is the most refractory to treatment, difficult bug to treat. What would you start off with? What would you give these patients? Yes, uh, this is one of the species where we need subspecies as per the ATS guideline. The three subspecies like abscesses, boleti, and uh, mesilency. Second thing is this is the bug where it's usually non-responsive to the treatment and the rapidly progressing pulmonary disease. That's why. That's why. Uh, we need uh, before st starting the treatment whether it is a azithromycin resistant or not. Means uh, there are azithromycin, this group of bacillus uh, usually either a mutant resistant or indiscible resistant. This species needs a little bit uh, 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 treatment, little bit different from the rest of species. What I mean to say, this is having intensive phase like tuberculosis, it is also a continuation phase. Sure. In intensive phase, we need injectable in addition to oral drug. In injectable drug, we have uh, a basket of uh, amikacin, imipenem, uh, sepoxetim, and uh, tetracycline. Whereas in oral form, we have azithromycin or clarithromycin, clofazimine, linozolid. So, in duration of treatment in intensive phase, roughly around say two to three uh, months, so depends upon the resistant pattern. If uh, say azithromycin or any clarithromycin sensitive. So at least three active drug, in vitro active drug, means in vitro sensitive drug to be added. 
whereas if it is azithromycin resistant, at least four drugs in vitro sensitive to be added. So yeah. in intensive phase, roughly around uh, at least for uh, susceptible variety, one to two injectable, whereas uh, in a resistant variety, either it could be neutral resistant or could be indiscipline resistant, at least uh, two injectable drug. Whereas sure. in, uh, in oral drug, uh, in uh, susceptible variety, at least two, in a, a resistant variety, two to three can be added. And about the duration of treatment, duration of treatment exactly it is very difficult to predict. However, age for the uh, study available, the average uh, not less than 12 months of treatment. This is all about the yeah. microvectrum abscesses. Yeah. 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 So absolutely, very nicely explained again, Dr. Pothan. The only challenge we face is about giving these injectable drugs in the long term, isn't it? You can probably get away by with giving an aminoglycoside once a day. But you know, the cefoxitin, the imipenem, etc. Dr. Suryakant spoke a little bit while ago about the cost of treatment. You know, you can imagine what uh, cost of treatment for imipenem or a TJ cycle in the long term is likely to be even if you manage to give these drugs at home, yes. which is why the dropout rates, which is why the refractoriness of the therapy comes to four in these patients so it's challenge i yes, think yes, uh, you yes, yes you describe the plan very nicely but uh, it's a challenge to deliver this treatment so one quick question last question to you tarang and then we'll come to the question box before we finish um extra pulmonary disease um bugs would remain the same would you treat them any different would you monitor them any different uh, mm -hmm. briefly any highlights about extra pulmonary ntm so extra pulmonary NTM, sir, uh, surgery should always be considered. Surgical debulking remains a mainstay. The second thing is there is a wide spectrum of the bugs also that cause uh, extra, uh, extra pulmonary disease. It would be the rapid growers to something like, uh, like abscesses. Uh, so the basics of treatment they remain the same. But in extra pulmonary disease, all attempts should be made at, at having uh, surgical treatment as a focus of our treatment. Followed by chemotherapy, sure. of course. But otherwise, the uh, the the general principles of, of treatment they remain the same. Yeah. Okay. Grand. So um, I'll take some questions from the question box, but just to tell all of you that we have an astonishing number of one zero three eight logins at the moment, and it stayed the same throughout um, the meeting. So um, I'm uh, very excited, very pleased to see the amount of interest it's generated. And it's only on a CCI uh, platform that you um, see logins like this with people staying till the end of the meeting. Uh, quickly, uh, Dr. Radha Munji, I'll keep you only two more minutes, I promise. And then we'll all sign out because the questions we have in the question box mainly have been answered. So um, there's questions about drug sensitivity, duration of treatment of NTM. There's a question about patients who are post renal transplant and the culture shows that there is presence of NTM. How long would you treat for? Which is a challenging question. It's the same for TB2. I would think that if someone is on continued immunosuppression, it would take a brave man to stop treatment, especially with NTM. So, I mean, um, we have all told you one year from culture negativity. So you would probably want to do longer here but i think getting culture negativity in the first place is going to be a challenge yes. in a patient yes. who is on transplant is a question. easy question to answer my friend um there is also a question about radiological diagnosis which we have covered already um there's a interesting question about covid and ntm so I don't know about any of you. I have personally not seen any patient with post-COVID fibrosis who's got NTM. Uh, I would be interested to know whether anyone on the platform has or not. Uh, any of our faculty today has seen a case with uh, COVID and NTM? No, no, no idea. No, I, no, uh, I not. My, my personal opinion, Raja, is though we have not seen, this question has opened our eyes to look at our own post-COVID patients with yeah. a new vision. So probably we sure. may come across. And uh, another important thing when we think about these uh, post-COVID cases are that, um, uh, you know, they as it is, we are seeing they are coming recurrently with uh, some of the other respiratory symptoms. Uh, so we would like to look into that. And sure. we do not so know whether thing, it comes... Uh, yeah. Just a moment. I wanted to add that. Yeah, sure. 
Sure. All of a sudden, there was a surge in Newpor cases. You know, when a uh, COVID wave came, and we never knew what happened and what has now. How come they have all disappeared? Even if we have cases who are post COVID uh, around us, so we don't know. Uh, this has really opened our eyes, and uh, we might sure. get something if we look into that. As yeah. of now, yeah. I don't think we have any literature, also as well as experience of it. Yeah, so I think one of the reasons, and again, I'm sort of thinking aloud, is that this amount of reversibility that we have seen in post-COVID ILD yes. cases. You know, most yes. of us don't really see the fibrosis long term, and unless you have a continued damaged, chronically damaged lung, it's unlikely that NTM is going to grow in that lung, which is why maybe there will be cases, but they'll be very, very rare going forward. There's one last question about lung cancer and NTM, and I think. Uh, incidentally, you might detect NTM. I have seen TB coexisting with lung cancer. I'm sure the other people on the panel have too. Uh, what do we do with these patients? So I think if your patient is going to get chemotherapy for the lung cancer once you've diagnosed it, and even if you incidentally detect NTM, which is one of the ones that we have discussed till now, you know, the cancer, the mycobacterium, avium, intracellulare, the abscesses, etc. I would actually treat these patients because the disease might flare up given the immunosuppression that you're going to give these people. So I think that's a very interesting question, but um, I would treat these cases if I'm going to immunosuppress these patients in the long term, like any other immunosuppressive condition. Um, uh, so thank you very much. I wonder whether Dr. Suryakant has a one-line parting message for everyone, uh, a wise man's remark to end off with, and then uh, we'll thank everyone and conclude. Dr. Suryakant. Uh, thank you, CCI, uh, the leadership, uh, the founder and the organizer and wonderful moderator, Dr. Rajadhar. And I think this is the message that this is the high time when we should uh, be vigilant about the approaching a case of pulmonary tuberculosis or a follow-up case of pulmonary tuberculosis or a chronic lung disease that one wonder some, uh, sometime you may have, you may encounter with NTM. So be vigilant. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Surya Kant, Dr. Dev Kishore Gupta, who is not with us, uh, but he was kind enough to join us from a flight. Dr. Taran Kulkarni, Dr. Sudarshan Pothal, Dr. Radha Munje, uh, the entire team of CCI headed by Dr. N.H. Krishna. I think absolutely flattered to be a part of this meeting again. And the platform, CIPLA, for supporting the CCI webinars all the way through for so many months and years. So thank you very much for logging in. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.